Hi guys, it is a dark, dreary, gloomy, depressing day here in the end times, here in the, in the silent tomb of the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, this gloomy Saturday, August 11th, 2018, and uh, so I have not opened the mainstream media news since Monday morning. Uh, so you can imagine the main reason I haven't opened the the uh, mainstream media news here in the Adirondack Mountains is because this is the worst internet I have ever encountered since the Peruvian Amazon. The trick to finding good internet in the Adirondacks is to find a Chinese restaurant. Because you better believe that, uh, that, that Asians are not going to tolerate this bullshit. So anyway... I ordered me up some uh, sesame chicken <coughs> and some good internet, and so I can bring you, for the first time, I believe since Monday, my mainstream media doomer headlines for the day, and this is going to be part one and two. So here are a few of the climate change stories. Wow. Wow. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So I've been off the mainstream media for going on a week, and I turn on the mainstream media to see Cruz, Cruz, C-R-E-W-S, Cruz battle growing wildfire near homes in California. No shit, Sherlock. What goddamn town is it today? Actually, it's not northern California. It's moved south where 20,000 people have now been evacuated from some little yuppie enclave look called Lake Elsinore, California, where firefighters were working furiously yesterday to keep a wildfire from burning more homes. Blah, blah, blah. But uh, maybe what I'm seeing outside the windshield is not gray, rainy skies. Maybe, according to Time Magazine, what I'm seeing here in New York is smoke from California wildfires. Smoke from California wildfires is reaching the East Coast. Take it away, Time Magazine, smoke billowing from the destructive fires burning throughout California this summer have spread far beyond the Golden Gate, now reaching the East Coast. Good Lord. New York and Massachusetts can now see the smoke manifest itself through gray skies and vibrant sunsets. Good lord, we're so fucked. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Uh, moving on. California wildfires are causing billions in damage. Who will pay? Huh. In the past few decades, wildfire season in California has expanded from a few months each year to a year-long phenomenon. This summer's Carr and Mendocino complex fires, which together have so far burned more than 400,000 acres, um, follow a string of smaller but still disastrous blazes earlier this year and last. Yes. So, let's take a step outside of the climate connections to all of this and 
open a window into an increasingly relevant legal question as the signals of climate change appear more frequently, who should bear the responsibility when climate disaster strikes? It's a question that climate change activists have floated in courthouses, but the answer is still yet to be determined. Yep, yep, yep. Everyone pointing their fingers each at each other. Imagine that. And the problem is only going to get worse with time. A May report from the state described climate change as a, quote, real, immediate, and growing threat to California's future, close quote. Huh. Do you think so? Anyway, we will see who is going to pay. Who is going to pay? Courts have thus far uh, expressed skepticism, not necessarily at the fault of oil and gas companies, but at the ability of the judicial system to deal with it. Yeah, deal with it, people. As the situation in California shows, figuring out who pays for the devastation brought by climate change could not happen fast enough. But as long as we're over there in the shithole state of California, we have a new world record coming out of Cal from Imperial California where it rained last week when it was 119 degrees outside. The bizarre event set a new world record for the hottest temperature ever measured while rain was, follow was falling. Does Anyone need to know the definition of the wet bulb temperature? So, what does rain on scorching hot days feel like? Huh. One imperial resident said that the rain made it difficult to breathe and it felt hard on their heart. That is called the wet bulb temperature, already showing up in Imperial, California. So, uh, what's the latest update from today from the shithole state of California to the shithole state of Florida? Wow, where devastating toxic algae bloom continues to plague Florida's Gulf Coast. Tons of dead fish, a smell so awful you gag with one inhale. Empty beaches, empty roads, empty restaurants, a toxic algae bloom has overrun Florida's southern Gulf Coast this summer, devastating sea life and driving people from the water. The algae turns the water toxic for marine life, and in recent weeks, beachgoers have been horrified to find turtles, large fish, and even manatees wash up dead. Here is Beach, Holmes Beach resident Alex Cuisine, quote, I can't describe the smell. It's like unbelievable. It makes you throw up. He said, as just a few feet away, hundreds of dead fish clogged a boat ramp. Okay, as long as we're in the shithole state of Florida, they're just talking about Florida here, but 
you better believe that what's bad for Florida is bad for anywhere on the planet where sea turtles uh, are breeding or still managing to breed for a few more years. This story I've been talking about for years, I guess this is just the 2018 update about why endangered sea turtles may be losing their male population. Yes. Uh, quote, this is biologist Jeanette Weinken. We're seeing fewer and fewer and fewer years where we find males. So seven out of the last ten years, we have not found any males. Not a single one, close quote. Not one single male baby sea turtle has been found in seven of the last ten years, I think implying, including 2018, uh, that not one male sea turtle, baby sea turtle, and take a wild guess why it is the temperature of the sand. The tipping point is 85 degrees, so the hotter the sand is over 85 degrees, the uh, less, the fewer baby sea turtles you have, and the extrapolation being that in a few more years there will be zero baby male sea turtles being born. Do your own math. From the sea turtles in Florida to the sea birds in Alaska. Alaska seabird deaths continue trend tied to warming ocean. No shit, Sherlock. So if the warming beach doesn't get you, the warming ocean will. <clears throat> Federal wild life officials are documenting a die-off of Alaska seabirds stretching from the north of the Bering Strait to the Gulf of Alaska that may be connected to a trend of warming ocean water. Carcasses examined so far have shown no indication of disease. Seabirds have been found emaciated and starved and changed ocean conditions may have affected their prey. Uh, this is bird hugger Catherine Kulitz. Quote, as in the past, these die-offs in the summer of 2018 have been associated with unusually warm water conditions. That has only increased in the last few years. No shit, Sherlock. Okay, from the shithole state of Alaska to the shithole territory of Puerto Rico, what is the latest flip-flopping headline on how many people died in uh, Hurricane Maria? Now, uh, Puerto Rico is estimating that Hurricane Maria killed more than f killed more than fourteen hundred people. No shit, Sherlock. Bullshit detected. Take precaution. Uh, yeah, I, I guess ten thousand is more than fourteen hundred. So yeah, I guess you can't argue that Puerto Rico is estimating that Hurricane Maria killed more than 1,400 people, though the confirmed death toll remains frozen at 64, pending a scientific review. Was it 64? Was it 1,400? Was it 10,000? You choose. Now... Guys, I did a full rant 
on this just yesterday uh, from the BBC News, but right here in Yahoo News from a, a website. I don't even know which website this is from. Uh, in case you missed the full rant, the planet is dangerously close to the tipping point for a hot out house Earth. No shit, Sherlock. This so called hot house Earth, where global temperatures will be four to five degrees Celsius or seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit higher than pre industrial temperatures and sea levels will be 33 to 200 feet higher than today is hard to imagine, but easy to fall into, said a new perspective article published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. In the article, a group of scientists argues that there is a threshold temperature above which natural feedback systems, can you say tipping points, that currently keep the earth cool will unravel. At that point, a cascade of climate events will thrust the planet into a hothouse state. Though the scientists don't know exactly what this threshold is, <coughs> they say it could be as slight as 2 degree C. Huh. Sound familiar? Hmm. This is their quote from Johann Rockström. Quote, This paper gives very strong scientific support that we should avoid coming too close or reaching two degrees Celsius warming. No shit, Sherlock. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. What is my old buddy Robert Hunsaker doing this week? He had the good fortune of interviewing uh, climatologist Peter Wadhams, and I want to send out a big thank you to uh, to Robert. Robert, uh, he didn't recommend Hambone Littletail. He recommended that guy over there in Collapse Chronicles that uh, that uh, my little milk toast twin, Sam Mitchell, over there at Collapse Chronicles uh, would be a good person to interview him, and Peter Wadhams Tentatively, has been uh, has agreed to an interview with Collapse Chronicles, but of course, since I have nowhere in the state of New York in the twenty in the year twenty eighteen to find a a goddamn internet connection that I can trust, uh, I might just have to wait till I get back to Austin, Texas. But anyway, thank you, Peter. But. Uh, so what uh, was Peter talking, uh, I mean, what was Robert talking to Peter about? Uh, my first question, Robert's first question, what is the single most serious threat to the planet? Without hesitation, Dr. Wadhams explained a sudden and huge pulse of methane out of the East Siberian Arctic Shelf originating from its extraordinarily shallow waters. Uh, yes, those extraordinarily shallow waters expose vulnerability to global warming over miles upon miles of methane concentration. Yep, yep, yep. The dilemma is the permafrost cap is rapidly thawing also as a result of anomalous retreat of summer sea ice. So my follow-up question to Peter, what will be the impact of a 50 gigaton 
methane pulse. Peter's answer, quote, it would wipe out civilization within five years. No shit, Sherlock. So we're sitting around waiting for the methane bomb to blow, and it is ticking away. Okay, let's go over to the shithole country of North Korea. Red Cross warns of food crisis in North Korea as crops fail in heat. A heat wave in North Korea has led to rice, corn, and other crops withering in the fields, quote, with potentially catastrophic effects, close quote, the Red Cross said on Friday. The world's largest disaster relief network warned of a risk of a, quote, full-blown food security crisis, close quote, in the isolated country where a famine in the mid-1990s killed up to three million people. Uh, there has been no rainfall since early July as temperatures have soared to an average of 39 degrees Celsius, otherwise known as 102 Fahrenheit, across the country. The population of 25 million is already stressed and vulnerable with malnutrition among children that could worsen stunting their growth. There you go. But don't worry. It's right here on the mainstream media. So it's got to be true. It has got to be true. Right here. Let's go to the shithole country of Brazil and listen. What is the Brazilian Environment Ministry? the Brazilian Environment Ministry saying this week in the mainstream media, Brazil has cut its deforestation emissions below 2020 targets. Oh, come on now. That ain't even bullshit. That's horseshit. Brazil cut <coughs> its greenhouse gas emissions from deforestation in 2017 to levels below its internationally agreed 2020 climate change targets. The country's environment ministry said on Thursday. Warning, warning, bullshit alert. Oh, Brazil reduced its emissions from deforestation in the Amazon rainforest by 600 million tons. Huh. And in the Cerrado Savanna, emissions were reduced 170 million tons. That was bullshit. Wow. Apparently, Reuters News has never read the book 1984. Hmm. Said Thiago Mendes. Secretary of Climate Change in the Brazilian Environment Ministry, quote, the policy message is that we can and should remain in the Paris Agreement because it is possible to effectively implement the commitments that we have made. Bullshit detected. Take precautions. All right. From the Brazilian government to the Chinese government. Again, reporting by Reuters News, reporting directly from the novel 1984. China to target emission monitoring in steel and coal-fired power. China will work 
to improve the monitoring of emissions from heavy industries like steel, coal-fired power generation, coke, and chemicals in key regions over the coming three years, stepping up an already intensive campaign to tackle smog. Oh, come on now. That ain't even bullshit. That's horseshit. It says the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment. China has been trying to crack down on fraudulent data reporting and the misuse and manipulation of monitoring equipment. Warning, warning, bullshit However, a report to China's parliament in July warned that there were still enforcement gaps. Enforcement gaps and a shortage of monitoring points in some regions in China. No shit, Sherlock. But finally it has happened, guys, and we will wrap it up. Part one of today's Doomer headlines, we finally see the word chemtrails showing up in the mainstream media. The strange role of chemtrails in the debate about fixing climate change. And thank you, this is some outfit calling itself Inverse, uh, talking about solar radiation management, which everyone calls chemtrails. Uh, anyway, uh, after a little bit of history, we get... Uh, to the to the meat of the story about whether you call it solar radiation management, geoengineering, or chemtrails. Well, everyone can now rest assured that this project, if it ever stood a chance, is likely to be mothballed forever. That was bullshit. Likely to be, can, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, that solar radiation management is likely to be mothballed forever after new research led by a team at the University of California at Berkeley's Global Policy Laboratory has determined that spraying the upper atmosphere with sulfides to create stratospheric sulfur aerosols from a petrochemical reaction would likely be counterproductive to the task of mitigating climate change. No shit, Sherlock. The group published their results Wednesday in the journal Nature. Yes. Uh... So let's get down to the bottom line of this. Uh, what is the bottom line? Quoting one of these uh, earth huggers, Professor Proctor. Huh. Before I started the study, I thought the net impact of changes in sunlight would be positive, so I was quite surprised by the finding that scattering light decreases yields, blah, blah, blah. Quote, society, right, overall, Proctor thinks there are a lot of risks and a lot of unknowns surrounding the idea of large-scale geoengineering and that a great deal more study is needed before even thinking of implementing something that would tweak the whole world's atmosphere. This is something that most chemtrail conspiracy theorists would probably agree with. Quote, Society needs to be objective about geoengineering technologies and develop a clear understanding of the potential benefits, costs, and risks. At present, uncertainty about these factors 
dwarfs what we understand. No shit, Sherlock. And we have hit 30 minutes on the second, so I am going to wrap up part one of uh, today's Doomer headlines and move into part two, just kind of a flotsam and jetsam collection of stories of how we are so fucked with no help from climate change coming up in one minute. Bye, guys.